uh, in this second lecture, what we're going to do is basically we are going to work on some of the concepts that Andrew explained in the first lecture and apply them to the specific case of the small angle neutron scattering. So some of the uh, ideas that Andrew explained, for example, scattering length, scattering length density, and so on, will be refreshed, and then we will um, talk a bit more about how we use them in small angle neutron scattering. Okay. So just to start uh, with uh, almost uh, one of the last messages from Andrew, we're going to talk about uh, scattering length. So uh, the scattering length is this parameter B that is used to quantify the interference between the between the neutrons and the and the atoms. Okay, so basically we have here a neutron that is a point scatterer. This also applies to X-rays, but I'm gonna specifically talk about neutrons now. Uh, so we have uh, neutrons, which is a point scatterer, and we, we have this uh, incoming wave vector that it's basically the, the, the beam that we use. And then we have some scattering at a given angle that is uh, two pi, okay? So basically here, uh, we have some scattered neutrons uh, at this scattering angle. And, and, and what happens here is that the phase of the scattered wave it uh, depends on this uh, interference factor that is the scattering length of this uh, of this given atom. Okay, so basically here we can uh, predict how this uh, phase of the scattered wave will be will behave uh, depending on what we have there uh, in terms of materials. Okay, so basically uh, it's important to know that. Uh, the scattering length for, diff for uh, the different atoms uh, uh, varies in a random fashion for neutrons. Whereas for X-rays, as X-rays interact with, uh, with electrons, what happens is that the more electrons we have in a, in a given atom, the stronger is gonna be the interaction. So we have this linear relationship where the scattering length uh, for X-rays is calculated as the atomic number multiplied by the classical radius of, your, uh, of, of, of the electron. Okay, so it's uh, this value here. Okay, so uh, this, this difference uh, is actually quite useful because for example, for neutrons, we also have this uh, isotope dependence. So uh, different isotopes will interact in a different way with, uh, with, um, uh, with, uh, with the neutrons. So for example, here we have the case of uh, protium, deuterium and tritium, and we can say that the scattering length is different for each of these isotopes, whereas the scattering length for hydrogen and for for these three uh, uh, for these three uh, hydrogen isotopes is the same in X-rays. So this means that X-rays cannot differentiate between them, and that's not the only advantage of this uh, different behavior in terms of the scattering length. So, for example. If we want to study something that is very close in the in the in the periodic table, with X-rays it becomes challenging because we have very little contrast difference between these two. So the scattering length between two atoms that are close in the periodic table in X-rays will look very similar when we use X-ray scattering. But in neutrons, we 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 have this random variation. And for example, if we want to investigate something that is a uh, manganese, and I don't remember what is after manganese. Does anyone know? I think it's iron. So if we want to investigate something that has manganese and iron, we can use neutrons to get a super good contrast between these two elements. Whereas in X-rays, they are 25 and 26. So they are just two, they are there. So the actually the different the scattering length is very small. Therefore the contrast is gonna be small and we will not have uh, super good uh, data if you use X-rays, okay? Whereas neutrons will be good for this, okay? So if we derive this uh, concept of, uh, of scattering length and scattering uh, of a point scatterer from a point scatterer. For an ensemble of atoms, we get this equation, which is the differential scattering cross section, which Andrew have already presented. So basically here, we have two main contributions to this scattering uh, cross section, which basically will measure the number of neutrons we are having in a given scattering angle. So this is kind of like the scattering that we are gonna measure. Uh, is related to the scattering that we are going to measure. So what happens here is that we have two main contributions. So we have the interaction, which basically 
uh, is to uh, tell us how uh, using this scattering lens, tell us how the different atoms would interact with the neutrons. And then we have this factor here that accounts for the spatial distribution of the different atoms in the ensemble. Okay. So normally when we are doing a small angle neutron scattering experiment, or when we are doing a scattering experiment, what we want to investigate, uh, uh, sorry, a diffraction scattering experiment, what we want to investigate is the spatial distribution of the atoms, because we want to get this structural information from the system. Okay, so when we are talking about the small angle neutron scattering, what often happens is that we are investigating the structures in the mesoscopic scale. So we are talking about something that ranges from a few nanometers to hundreds of nanometer. And as you can imagine, if we are gonna treat this system from a atomistic point of view, that's gonna be very challenging because we are, we are gonna have lots of atoms there and it's very complicated. So. The only thing that we have to do is to use a technique, in this case, a small angle scattering, uh, that, the resolu that we lose the, this uh, atomistic resolution. So the resolution of the, our experiment is not gonna be good enough to investigate uh, atomic, uh, to get like atomistic information. This might not sound great, but it's actually the principle by which small angle neutron scattering works. So what happens here, as Andrew explained before, is that when we have this ensemble of atoms or these systems, I'm gonna use as Andrew did H2O for example, uh, and we look at the scattering and density profile, what happens here is that at the beginning, we have a high SLD because of the oxygen and then it decreases because we have hydrogen and then it increases again because we get this second salvation layer where we have oxygens again. So there is some kind of uh, structure because of the hydrogen bonding in water. And then it just like goes down again because we have hydrogen, uh, but it's, al it's already less pronounced at the first oscillation. And then we get to a point where we have this constant uh, scattering length density. Okay, so we get to this point where the length, where the density is not depending on the atomistic structure anymore. So this is the concept of SLD, and this is what we actually use in the small angle neutron scattering to simplify the systems that we are gonna investigate, okay? So basically beyond this distance, I like call R star, the atomistic information is lost. So the SLD for that particular ensemble of atoms can be considered contest constant if the, if the resolution of our experiment is low enough. Okay, so this is the concept of uh, the concept of scattering length density. So basically, is the sum of all of the uh, scattering lengths of the of the atomic ensemble divided by the volume of that uh, ensemble. Okay, so basically, uh, the scattering length density is used to quantify the scattering power of that ensemble of atoms. Uh, it's a very useful technique. It's a very useful concept because it means that we don't have to basically count everything uh, atom by atom. Uh, and then and what happens here is that the scattering intensity that we get is proportionally to, it's proportional to the square of the of the uh, of the differences in the SLD. Okay. So we have this difference in the SLD, which is the if we have let's say a simple system. So this is the most simple scenario where we have for example a matrix which we can call solvent. And then we have some dispersed particles in the mesoscopic scale. Okay, so what happens here is that the intensity will be proportional to the square of the differences between these. And this is what we call the scattering axis. Okay, so this is what we uh, are going to use to get uh, a scattering signal. So uh, then again, we can uh, take this uh, uh, scattering cross section and calculate the macroscopic scattering cross section by normalizing the this system to the by integrating this to the entire scattering volume. And what happens here is that this is the scattering length density distribution. Okay, so this is the differences that we have in the system, the, uh, the inhomogeneities we have in the system that. Uh, that produce this scattering intensity. And this is actually what we want to investigate in, in, a, in a science experiment, the, the distributions of SLD, okay? So uh, as I said before, the scattering length between the different particle, between the different atoms is also isotope dependent. And this, get, this give us the possibility of using uh, isotopic leveling and contrast variation to study uh, complex systems. So the, the, the idea behind this is that, for example, if we replace 
uh, hydrogen by deuterium, the chemistry of the system very often, which is not always the case, but the chemistry of the system will have, uh, will show very little differences. Okay, so the chemistry of the system will be different or will not be different, but the interaction with the neutrons will be different. So basically it's like getting pictures of the same thing, but from a different perspective. Okay, and this is the idea behind the contrast variation approach. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna modify for example, the SLD of the solvent, and then we are going to get different scattering profiles, but all of them come from the same uh, morphology, from the same structure. So we can use this to study uh, systems, uh, uh, a structure to gain like a structural information from, from the system. Okay. So the first thing to keep in mind is that as the difference in the SLD, so this scattering axis is is a square uh, in our scattering equation. What happens here is that the, if we have a two-phase system and the and, and two system, I mean, the two samples have uh, exactly the same structure, and the only difference between these two systems is the distribution of SLD. So it's opposite. So basically, here the SLD of particle one is, is the same as the SLD of the solvent or matrix two. And, uh, and for the particle two, it's vice versa, okay? So what happens here is that this value means that uh, that the scattering axis is gonna be the same. So because uh, of this fact, uh, we cannot, by taking one single measurement in, this, uh, in, in, in a SANS experiment, we actually cannot know what is the, uh, sign of this scattering length density distribution. So because this is a square, we don't know if this is negative or and, and this is positive or vice versa, because all of the phase information is lost when we square this, uh, when we when we square this uh, uh, SLD profile, okay? So, uh, and if we go back to the scattering equation and, uh, and, and we say that uh, this, uh, so we say that the scattering, the uh, scattering cross-section and macroscopic scattering cross-section is proportional to the form factor, which will be introduced later. And this form factor is equal to the uh, square of the amplitude of the form factor, okay? So this means that we have our form, our, uh, sorry, we have the amplitude of our form factor here, which is the blue one, and then we take the square, and that basically means that all of our negative values of the amplitude of the form factor at lost in this squaring process. So basically it means that if we want to gain this structural information that is contained in the amplitude of the form factor, we need to reconstruct this scattering length density profile. And that's the main goal when it comes to analyzing uh, SANS data. What you're actually doing is you are trying to find a way to reconstruct the scattering length density profile of the system. And that's because we cannot just simply perform an, an, an inverse Fourier transform of this data. Uh, because as Andrew explained before, the, this microscopic, so this uh, scattering cross section uh, is basically the Fourier transform of the scattering length density distribution of the, of the, of the system. Uh, but but as, as it has this square factor, all of these negative values are lost. So we cannot just perform a, a, a an inverse Fourier transform uh, to, to gain this uh, raw var again. So we have to use uh, the different uh, data analysis approaches that we will explain tomorrow. Uh, and an interesting uh, thing about this is that one way to get around this thing, which is called the Bavinet's principle, sorry, I forgot to mention, one way to get around this, this, this problem of the information lost and uh, this problem that the that the coherent scattering is the same for these two samples is to play with contrast variation approaches. Okay, so contrast variation approaches, as I introduced before, it's basically we play with the contrast in the system by exchanging uh, different uh, by exchanging different parts of the system by uh, different isotopes. Okay, so I have one, this is one of my favorite pictures when it comes to contrast variation. So basically what happens here is that there is a monster visiting these uh, two old guys. And as you can see, the old lady is sitting in the sofa and wearing exactly the same pattern that surrounds her. So basically the monster comes and the monster comes and he, uh, he cannot see her. 
but the old guy is wearing a different pyjamas and basically he will be the board because of course, the monster could detect him. So this is the main idea between its contrast variation approach is that we want to selectively uh, enhance or hide the contribution to the scattering from different parts of the system. So this is a quite common approach in science experiments. As I said before, when we have to resolve a complex structure, it comes for, uh, it comes very handy because it can see you we can use this to simplify the system as I will introduce now. And, uh, and, uh, and the way to do this is by playing with the isotopic composition of the system. Uh, so in, in, in soft matter, which is my field, the most common approach is uh, to, to do a hydrogen deuterium exchange, but actually you can use different types of uh, isotopic labeling. Uh, so it's not only limited to hydrogen and deuterium. So, uh, Basically, this uh, will help us to study specific parts of the system by highlighting some uh, particular features or hiding some others. And we can use this to investigate complex systems. So for example, when we have a mixture of nanoparticles of, uh, of, of different composition and we want to investigate them. So let's just imagine that we have uh, different nanoparticles that are gonna have in the next example and we can, we can resolve uh, the shape of those nanoparticles in, uh, individually as I will show you now. And there are other complex systems, for example, a mixture of polymers or protein detergent complexes that can benefit from the invest from investigations that involve contrast variation approaches. So there are different uh, neutron contrast conditions. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the most simple contrast conditions that you can have in the small angle scattering. And normally, what happens in when you are investigating a, a system that is relatively complex. Uh, is that you have a mixture of, of, of some of these, okay? So you have a finite contrast when there is one difference between uh, one scattering axis. So we have one set of particles and uh, in a matrix, these particles have a different SLD than the matrix. So basically we have uh, uh, this finite contrast condition. So zero contrast is when, uh, even if you don't believe it, there are some particles in here, but basically what we have learned is that we have uh, match the SLD of the of the matrix to the SLD of uh, of the particles, and this means that neutrons will not be able to see them as we cannot see them here now. And the intensity arising from the system, uh, the coherent scattering arising from the system, will be actually zero when we subtract the background contribution. Okay. Uh, then we can have a system where we have multiple contrasts. And this is, for example, what I said before about when we have a mixture of different nanoparticles. So we have one nanoparticle that has one weaving composition and therefore one SLD. And then we have a second population of nanoparticles that have this second SLD, okay? So if we have this in a, in, in, in a given matrix, we can have this situation where we have two different scattering nexus coming from the particle uh, matrix correlations. So we have the difference between the SLD of these particles and the difference of uh, the SLD of the solvent, and the difference between the SLD of these particles and the SLD of the solvents. Okay, and this is just speaking about particle solvent correlations because there will also be obviously a correlation between the SLD of these two particles. So what happens here, as you can imagine, is that the analysis of a system like this becomes far more complex than the analysis of a system like this. So the contrast variation approach, what it allows you to do is to convert this system in a simple system like this. And, and we can do that by just playing with the deuteration in, the, in this case of the, with the isotopic lab in this case of the matrix. So basically we just disperse these particles in a matrix where uh, that, has the, that fulfills the condition that the SLD of the matrix it's equal to the SLD of one of these particles, in this case, the blue. And what happens here is that we will effectively see this scattering from these red particles. So even if there are blue particles floating around, we will only see the red particles, the scattering coming from the red particles. And that's the concept between this contrast match condition uh, that we can reach to this uh, using these contrast variation approaches. Okay, so, this is probably the most commonly used approach when it comes to investigating uh, 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 complex systems using a, a small angle neutron scattering by, by varying the, the isotopic composition of the solvent. So 
one of the common approaches is that when you have a uh, water as the continuous phase is by exchanging some of the water by D2O. So you have like uh, light water, H2O and D2O. And we can play with the ratio of H2O and D2O without hopefully changing too much the chemistry of the system. Uh, that's, that is also something that I uh, will mention later, but it's something that we have to keep in mind. Okay, so uh, by changing the isotopic composition of the system, we assume that there is no major changes in the, in the chemistry of the system, but this is not always the case. So we have to be careful about that and I will mention it later, but this is something that we have to check. Okay, because for example, the isoelectric point uh, the electric point of proteins change. It's different when we have it in H2O and D2O. So the charges in the protein will be different and so on. So there are some things that we have to keep in mind when it comes to isotopic exchange, okay? So basically what happens here is that we have exactly the same structure. So it's this core shell particle that we have here. And this is just like a quick uh, simulation I've done using SASFI. What happens here is that we have this solvent uh, that I said that is uh, something close to D2O, so it has this uh, SLD, which is six, uh, six times 10 to the minus six uh, uh, Armstrongs to the minus two. And then we have this core shell particle that has an internal density distribution. So the shell has a different SLD to the core. Okay, so if we calculate the scattering for this particle, we get this green curve. Okay, and we see that it has some features and so on. So. If we want to investigate this using a contrast variation approach, the most uh, simple way of doing this will be just by exchanging the composition of the solvent. So basically what we do here is that by knowing the composition of the, of the shell, we can calculate what is the SLD of that shell and then just prepare an H2O, D2O mixture that has exactly that SLD. So basically when we put this in the neutron beam, we will get the scattering from the core that will look like this, and the shell will be uh, will be contrast match. So effectively, the shell will be invisible to the neutrons. And we can do the same thing in the other way around. So basically, here we have the core that is contrast match to the matrix or the solvent, and we are seeing the shell. And as we can see here, uh, the scattering curves that we get from these three different systems are different, but they all come from the same structure. So this is, as I said, one of the ways that we can use to obtain uh, structural information from complex system by simplifying them using contrast variation approaches. Okay, I didn't actually write it down here, but I just remember that it is something important that we have to keep in mind here, which is the incoherent cross section of H2O is much higher than the incoherent cross section of D2O. Uh, and as Andrew explained before, uh, the incoherent contribution in the small angle scattering experiment mainly comes, uh, mainly contributes to the background. So we have this four pi scattering, so it's not angle dependent, it just goes everywhere, it should be flat. Uh, but the H2O has a really, really strong contribution. So if we are gonna play with a contrast variation approach where we uh, at, uh, or we exchange the, the, the H2O to the two ratio, we have to keep in mind that by increasing the level of H2O, we are gonna also increase the we're going to also increase the incoherent contribution so we're going to also increase the incoherent background we have to keep this in mind because if we have something that is a weak scatterer so for example let's say that this uh, shell is a very 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 tiny contribution and here we have it in uh, in an h2o matrix we might be in the situation that basically we have no effective scattering coming from the shell because the incoherent background is so high that it just basically masks, uh, masks out all of the all of the coherent signal from the shell. So we have to keep in mind that when we play with the H2O to the 2O ratio or when we play with the H2D ratio in, in, in a sample, we will only not affect uh, the, the coherent signal, but we will also affect the incoherent signal. So we have to be careful with the amount of incoherent scattering. Okay, so just keep in mind that with more H2O will probably mean uh, worse data for you because the incoherent signal will be higher. So another approach 
to do uh, this, uh, this contrast match experiments is by playing with the deuteration of, in this case, the particles. So not only with the H2O and D2O. So here, for example, I've just put some uh, calculator and SLDs for different components. So we have H2O and D2O, and then we have this iron oxide and lysozyme here, okay? So uh, I'm just putting this as examples, but basically what I want to show here is, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's a few details. So for example, uh, what happens when you have proteins in solution is that you will have some H to the exchange in the iteration condition. So if you put this protein in, um, in, uh, in D2O, what will happen is that we will have an exchange of these exchangeable hydrogens uh, and they will, this protein, uh, uh, these protein atoms will go away and will be replaced by deuterium, some of them, okay? So we have to keep in mind that when we put a protein in solution, for example, there will be some exchange and it happens with, all, uh, with other type of, of uh, compounds, not only with uh, uh, not only with proteins, but you have to keep in mind that the SLD of your system might change when you put it in D2O, uh, the SLD of your particles, sorry. So for example, here you can see that as we increase the level of D2O in the system, we will also slightly increase the SLD of, uh, of the protein. And if you have DNA and other stuff, it might also happen that you uh, see a change in the, in the apparent SLD of your, of your particle, okay? And then here, what I wanted to show you here is that, for example, if we have uh, some surfactant that has some uh, tail that is uh, like a hydrocarbon tail, what happens is that we can also play with the deuteration of this, of this system, okay? Uh, so basically we can replace the, by using some uh, smart chemistry, we can, this is not as straightforward as just making a mixture of H2O and D2O, but by using some deuteration chemistry, you can uh, change the SLD of what will be hopefully your particle by replacing the proteins in this uh, tail by uh, deuterium. And this will effectively change the SLD of your system. Okay. So, uh, Another important aspect when you're doing a contrast match experiment or a contrast variation experiment is uh, to find the contrast match point, okay? So we can say that contrast variation is just the general term of playing with different contrast uh, to get different uh, uh, information. And the contrast match point is that we, can, we want to get uh, this uh, zero contrast condition where there is not effective scattering from this, uh, from a specific part of the system. So for example, here, uh, I don't really, ah, okay. They are measuring uh, silicon oxide particles and they wanted to determine the contrast match condition. So they wanted to determine at which level of solvent deuteration, the incoherent scattering is zero. Okay, so they wanted to actually determine where, when these uh, Ludox particles were invisible uh, to the neutrons. And to do that, uh, a common approach is that you basically take your particles and you disperse them in different uh, H2O to D2O ratios. So they, you, I mean, uh, they did this using all of these great points. It's like a million points they got using a microfluidic system, but you can also use, you can also do this by using some uh, discrete uh, H2O to D2O mixtures, which is the, these uh, circles here, okay? So what happens here is that then you put your particles in uh, in different H2 to the 2 ratios. So for example, here somewhere around 20%, something around 40 something, 60, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so what happens here is that uh, in each of these uh, H2O to the 2 ratios, we'll have a different coherent signal. And that's because we are changing, even if the particle is the same, if the form factor is the same, what is happening here is that we are effectively changing the scattering axis of the system of each of them, okay? So what happens here is that the scattering axis of the system is gonna be different to the scattering axis of this and so on. And the only diff uh, and, and uh, whereas the form factor of the particle will be the same. So then they started to measure all of these samples. And what happens is that, as you can see here, that the intensity gets to a point that it gets close to the signal of the solvent. So when we subtract the solvent contribution is, base, is effectively zero. And then we get this contrast match point, which tell us that around 
of D2O uh, in an H2O to D2O mixture, the contribution of these particles to the scattering will be effectively zero, okay? And as I said before, this comes handy when we want to uh, when we want to investigate a system that is complex, for example, as I said before, this mixture of nanoparticles. So if we have some other nanoparticles that have a different SLD, and we put both nanoparticles in uh, in uh, in a sixty percent uh, D2O uh, solvent, what will happen is that the contribution from these Lugox particles will be zero, and we will have only the scattering from the other nanoparticles. Okay, so this is one of the approaches that we can use for. Uh, determining the zero contrast condition. And as I uh, briefly mentioned before, uh, there are different ways to actually play around with the with the scattering excess and with this contrast variation approach. And uh, a slightly more complex approach is to use a deterioration, is to use deterioration chemistry to play with the deterioration of, uh, of, of, of different parts of the system. Uh, so here again, you are expecting that by using the deuterium label, chemicals, you will have a minimal impact uh, on the chemistry of the sample, but this is something that you have to check. It's not as simple as you're saying like, yeah, this is gonna be, this is not gonna change the chemistry of the sample. So you have to check and there are different approaches to, to, to do it. I will not go into detail, but if someone wants to know more, uh, I can I will, I can always uh, give them some further information. So what happens here is that we can, for example, here we have a lipid. This is DPPC. It's a common lipid that is used as a, it's commonly used as a model to, 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 uh, for biologic uh, membranes. So what happens here is that we have this proteated lipid. So basically it has a proteated tail, proteated head group. But then we can also get this lipid synthesized using deuterium. So we have these deuterated tails that are attached to a deuterated head. So this is like a per deuterated lipid. But then we can also have some more uh, complex uh, deuteration scheme. So we can have, for example, these tails only deuterated, whereas the head is proteated or vice versa. So we can have these proteated tails with a deuterated head. So when we want to, for example, determine the internal structure of a lipid bilayer, this is very useful because this approach will uh, help us to gain more uh, information on the system, more structural information on the system, because we can, for example, only contrast match the head group, or we can only contrast match the tail group and things like that. And this will help us to resolve uh, complex structures. So there are two ways of, uh, of, uh, of getting these deuteration materials. One way is to buy them, uh, but there is a limited availability of compounds. So you can get maybe DPPC, but if you are actually working with some more complex lipids, then it will be very unlikely that you can find them commercially. So the best way to get them is actually to talk to the neutron uh, facilities because they are often willing to collaborate and synthesize these uh, deuterated compounds for you if they are not commercially available. And uh, for example, at the ESS, they have the DMAX uh, labs that basically what they do is they synthesize uh, deuterated compounds for users. So it works on a proposal basis. So basically you submit your proposal and you say, I wanna do this neutron experiment. I need this, I need this uh, deuterated molecules. So basically they will say, they will, there will be like a panel to evaluate the, the, the the scientific interest and uh, feasibility of your experiment, and they will decide if you if they will they can make these uh, these uh, compounds for you. Okay, uh, so this will help you to elaborate some uh, more uh, complex uh, deuteration and contrast variation schemes. Uh, so and, uh, and uh, there are like a variety of them. But one of the, uh, I'm just gonna use one here as an example, which is a zero, the zero average contrast condition. Okay, so the zero average contrast condition is, for example, when you have particles in a matrix, you have two different populations of particles, and basically you 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 go to a, a system where you fulfill this condition. So basically, uh, the solvent of your SL, uh, the SLD of your solvent will be in between 
the SLD of these two particles. So yet, let's say that one of these is proliated and the other one is detrated. And basically, if we are uh, in this condition, what happens is that the interaction, like the interaction term cancels out. So the structural factor cancels out. And, uh, and this uh, that comes from the interaction between these particles and the single form factor of the particles can be calculated, okay? Uh, for this example, I'm sorry, I didn't realize, but for this example, all of the circles will have the same, okay? So this is uh, the most uh, simple uh, zero average contrast condition experiment, which is when we have particles that are identical and we just play with the deuteration level of those or with the SLD of those. So we have some particles that are, just use your imagination, equal in terms of shape, but they are different in terms of uh, SLD. So what happens here is that, for example, for this polymer case, we have this upturn and low Q that comes from the attractive potential between these polymers. But if we, uh, so basically that means that it's difficult to determine the form factor of the polymer. It's different, difficult to determine the, the, the structure of, of these uh, individual polymer chains because of this uh, structure factor. So what you do is then you prepare a sample in the zero average contrast condition, and we get rid of this, uh, of this interaction term. And then we have the form factor that we can just fit using some, uh, some form factor models and get information on the structure of this polymer, okay? So this is the most simple case of a zero average contrast condition uh, experiment, which is when uh, we use a mixture of deuterated and proteated uh, uh, particles, uh, and, but they have the same form factor. But this can be extended to more complex systems. And then we gain uh, uh, some different types of information. So I'm gonna, just gonna very briefly go through this example, but if someone is particularly interested in this type of approaches, we can, uh, uh, you can email me or you can contact me and I will uh, try to redirect you to the, right, uh, to the right information. So let's say now that you have a system that is forming a type of complex. So now these uh, particles, when we put them in solution, they will form this complex, let's say it's a one-to-one -one, or it can be, I don't know, uh, like a six-to-one or whatever. But what is happening is that it's forming a complex. So we can use this uh, contrast condition approach to determine uh, the, the state of the particle. So we can determine particle complexation, for example. And here it becomes a slightly more complex, this equation, but the idea behind this is exactly the same. So we want to determine the, the different contributions to the scattering by getting rid of the interaction term, okay? So what happens here is that uh, when this particle forms, uh, you have to keep in mind that the SLD of the solvent is in between these two. So it's at exactly one point that is equal to the, to the scattering intensity of these two together. Okay, so there is this contrast match condition that it's fulfilled. So what happens here is that we form a complex. So if we look at the SLD of the complex, it will be effectively the same as the SLD of the matrix. So it means that the low angle signal will be zero. So the scattering at I of zero will be zero because effectively the complex itself, so the entire complex is invisible to neutrons. But what happens here is that the internal structure of the system has a density correlation. So there is gonna be some scattering from this. And I have here some data that I uh, analyzed just to show you how this works, okay? So we have four different contrasts. And what happens here is that the red is the entire particle. So it's the entire complex. The black is uh, the red particle, for example, and the blue is the blue particle. So we can play with the deterioration of the solvent to get the structure of these three different uh, parts of the system. And then this green is actually the zero average contrast condition. So uh, if this uh, complex is, is formed, what happens here is that the I of zero will be equal to zero which is what we see here. So this is basically just noise. Uh, and this is because the SLD of this complex, when we see it, like when we see the entire complex is equal to the SLD of the matrix. But what happens is that as there is some density correlation inside 
this complex, then we will see this bump and high Q that will correlate to the structure inside the complex. So basically we can use, uh, this is just a very brief explanation of what we, how we can use this zero average contrast condition also to resolve uh, complex structures. For example, the formation of lipid domains, uh, complexation between nanoparticles. Uh, this was the case of some uh, protein surfactant interactions, but we can use this to investigate uh, different uh, complex morphologies, okay? Uh, now I'm gonna move a bit away uh, from uh, SANS. I'm gonna talk about SACs in connection to SANS. Uh, so basically, uh, SANS -SAC SACs are very, are very, very powerful techniques when they are put together. And that's because we can investigate the structure of a given system by playing with the contrast without the need of, of for example, using deuteration. Okay, so as Andrew, uh, I think Andrew talked about this too, but X-rays, uh, I also introduced it before, X-rays interact with electron clouds and neutrons interact with the nuclei of the, of the atoms in the, in the scattering volume. So we will get a different type of interaction, okay? But both of them are is looking at the same length of scale. So they are looking at the same structural information, let's say. So this makes these two techniques uh, complementary. And actually the co-refinement of SANS and SACS data has become a powerful technique to study different systems. So this is just uh, an example from neutron imaging on how an SLR camera looks on, uh, when we use neutrons or X-rays. So for example, here, we have here the film, which is gonna be highly, uh, I mean, it will have, it's basically plastic. So there will be lots of hydrogen in there, whereas the rest of the camera is some kind of metal. And this means that we, and with neutrons, we are gonna get like a good information about this uh, uh, part of the system that is uh, that has a high hydrogen content. Whereas the, uh, if we use X-rays, we will see the metal, but we will basically have no information on the plastic part on the one that is light. Okay, so the concept between using this, uh, the concept of using these two methods in com uh, of combining these two methods is basically, uh, gaining information of different parts of the system. So effectively getting different contrast. Okay. And I have here one example to clarify this, which is some, uh, I think is gold nanoparticles dispersed in an organic solvent and they are uh, colloidally stable because uh, someone put some, uh, I think it's some lipids, but I don't remember really well. So someone put some lipids around the, around the nano, the, I oh know it's not lipid. I think it's a, I think it's, yeah, some kind of surfactant or amphiphilic molecule. So what happens here is that the head group of the surfactant will attach to the nanoparticle and the tails will be floating around and this will be, will stabilize the nanoparticles uh, and prevent uh, coalescence, okay? So then, so, uh, then these people took some SANS and SACS measurements and this is how the data looks like, okay? And if we look at the scattering length density distribution of the scattering length density profile, we see that they are very different, okay? So this is the scattering length density distribution for X-rays and this is the one for neutrons. So what happens here is that if we look at the SLD values uh, and calculate the scattering excess, we see that for example, the scattering excess between the particle and the solvent is huge in comparison to the scattering excess between this shell around the particle uh, when we compare that to, to water, or to, sorry, no, so not water, to, the, to this organic solvent that is the, uh, the dispersant. So what happens here is that if we do some SACs, uh, as we can see from the, from the scattering axis, most of the intensity in this experiment will come from the scattering axis between the nanoparticle and the solvent. So because they will dominate and basically, this will be invisible. I mean, about 100% of the signal will come from the from the from the nanoparticle. But if we do some neutrons, we and we play with the deuteration, so we have some deuterated continuous phase, and we have some proteated uh, shell. What happens here is that the the nanoparticle scattering is much lower than that of this shell. So then in the neutron case, the, the, the scattering from the shell will dominate the signal. So basically we can combine these two methods 
to get information, uh, to get like little information on both the core, which is the nanoparticle and the shell, which is this ligand or surfactants that we are using to stabilize the nanoparticles. Okay, so what you have to do here, and I will go more, uh, tomorrow in more detail into this, is to use a simultaneous fitting approach. So basically we're gonna take all of this data together uh, we are going to take all of this neutron contrast and we are going to take also this X-ray contrast and we are going to build a structural model where the only difference between this, these contrasts will be the scattering length density. And, uh, and I think that this uh, picture of the, this drawing of, the, I guess, some cats, uh, it's a good uh, demonstration of that. Okay, so basically we have one system here where we see the two cats. Then we have one system here where we see only one cat. Then we have a system here where we see the cats, but in a different way to the first case. And then we see the other cat in this last one here. So the cats are the same in every picture. So what we have to do is to find one structural model that satisfies all of these contrast conditions. And that will give us a very robust answer in terms of the structure of the system. Uh, so basically the use of several contrasts will give us a, a more accurate validation of the model. And what we have to do, the way that we do this is either by corresponding different contrasts or introducing some constraints that we get from other systems. So for example, if, from other contrasts. So for example, if we know that this is the shape of this cat, then we can say for this, okay, we know the shape of this cat. So basically the signal from this will be the total signal minus the signal of this cat. Okay, so basically we can use this type of constraints to simplify the scattering data. Uh, another advantage of using contrast variation approaches as I introduced before is that we get rid of this phase problem. So as we have more contrast, we can build a more robust model that will get rid of this phase uh, problem where we could, uh, where it was more difficult to find the, the original scattering length and distribution. And, uh, and uh, something that I've yeah, briefly mentioned before is this isotope effect. Uh, so sometimes when we play with isotopes, we might have a strong impact in, uh, in the system. And uh, for example, if we talk about proteins and we put them in a, in a, in a buffer, uh, maybe if the buffer is detrated, the proteins might precipitate because the, the, the actual electric point of the protein is, is different in H2O and D2O. So we might be at the point where the proteins precipitate. So we have to keep in mind that there might be some isotopic effects that might also affect the structure of the system. So a good way to, to do this, to check for this, is to take all of your contrasts and put them in an X-ray machine. So measure sacks of all of your uh, different isotopic mixtures. If they all look the same in sacks, it means that the isotope effect has no effect on, uh, uh, on this particular system because the scattering from X-rays is gonna be the same. And as I said before, there is not isotope dependence when it comes to X-ray scattering. Okay, so if they all look the same, it means that we will not have uh, isotope effect that affects the structure. And uh, this is just an example of, uh, of a smurp, which is like a, some kind of a lipid nanodisc where we can have, uh, so basically what happens here is that we have uh, like a region of a lipid membrane that it's like entrapped in some kind of a nanodisc that might be polymer or protein or, or different types of system. But I wanna show you here is that this is a relatively complex structure. And if we only use one scattering curve here, there is gonna be so many parameters to fit that basically we won't be able to get a, 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 a reliable answer unless we use a contrast variation approach. So basically what happens here is that these people, what they did was measure the system in different contrast conditions. And then they found one structure that satisfied all of them. Okay, so basically here what happens is that they're gonna probably measure in different parts of the system and highlighting them as, well as, as it happens with these caps. Uh, just to briefly mention here that the agreement between these is not perfect. And that's actually often the case because there might be some polydispersity, there might be some uh, differences in the concentration between the different contrasts, and there might be some differences due to, iso to subtle isotopic effects. So, uh, it's difficult to get like a perfect fit, but I will say that this is extremely good 
fit when it comes to core refinement of different contrast. And I, I'm just gonna briefly go back here and, and this is the same case for this. Okay, you can see that if we look at the models individually, they might not be perfect, but if you put the picture together and you say that this model satisfy the four neutron contrast, I will say that that's a really good answer. Okay, so this is uh, everything that I had to say today. Uh, and uh, basically I'm just gonna briefly go through some of the things that I've uh, mentioned. And uh, I think that it's very important uh, that you know your system, that you know what kind of information do you wanna get. And the first question that you have to ask is, do I need neutrons? Or can I do this using some lighter scattering or X-ray scattering, which will be faster, cheaper, and easier. Uh, but if you need the use of neutrons, the first question that you have to ask yourself is how we can investigate this system in an effect, in an efficient way, in a, in a way that we can get the most of information uh, by, for example, using contrast variation. So you have to keep in mind if there are like internal density correlations, if we have a multi-component system and so on, and try to think on how we can benefit from a contrast variation approach. Then you have to consider the isotope effect. You have to consider if there is going to be some effects that uh, come from uh, from the exchange uh, of H2O and D2O, from the exchange of uh, hydrogen and deuterium, or any other isotopes. I've seen people doing contrast variation by exchanging, for example, between different isotopes of lithium and so on. So it's not only limited to HD. But uh, sorry if I go back to HD all the time, but that's because it's my I guess because it's what I use more often. Uh, another important aspect is where will you get your deuterated chemicals? Okay, not everyone has, I have here, not everyone has per deuterated cotton candy in the lab. And what I want to say with this is that deuterated chemicals are by no means as, as common as proteated chemicals or naturally abundant uh, uh, chemicals, so you have to keep this in mind. Where are you going to get them? You're going to request them to a deuteration facility. You're going to buy them. They're going to be expensive. You're going to need extra funding and so on. So you have to keep all of that in mind. And then uh, for more information on the different aspects of contrast and contrast variation in SANS, you can check uh, this book that is freely available uh, at the NIST website and it's called the SANS Toolbox. I think it's something like six or 700 pages, but there are some interesting, I mean, it's basically everything about the small angle neutron scattering. So you maybe you could check it out if you have uh, uh, some specific uh, questions about this. Uh, and after this, I'm done with my lecture. And if there is any questions, now it's the time to ask them. Seems like there are no, there are no questions. Uh, yes, I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, uh, actually, it's about the R star that you showed for a scattering length density of the oxygen and hydrogen, that after yeah. a certain R, it becomes constant. Yes. So this R star, is it a specific to the, every material system and how we can calculate that? Uh, um, this is like a general, uh, let's say it's a general conditions for the science experiment. Uh, because when you are looking at the Q range uh, that we are investigated with SANS, mm -hmm. uh, we have no atomistic information because the resolution of our experiment is low enough. Let's say that this R starts to become more important when we go, let's say, above 0 0.5 or 1 inverse Armstrong. So if we go above that Q value, we get into this, let's say, wide angle scattering. So it's not a small angle anymore. Uh, so when it comes to SANS, you don't really have to worry about this R star. It's more about when you go to this um, more complex, uh, yeah, or not more complex if uh, necessary, but when you're going to this wide angle scattering. Uh, and what you have to do there is you have to use a model that contains that type of atomistic information. So you will have to use simulations or you will have to use uh, some other approaches to gain information on this system. But when it comes to SANS, you don't have to worry about this R star because okay. basically the reason why SANS works as it does is because the resolution is not, let's say, good enough to get information on atomistic. Uh, yeah, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. You're welcome.
Any more questions? There's something in the chat. Uh, yes, uh, of course. So uh, Anton is asking if there are support labs in neutron facilities where iteration is possible. Yes. So uh, I will say that even now there is some kind of like common effort between the different facilities to kind of like be able to supply uh, to provide all of the all of the detroit chemicals required by uh, by users. Uh, so what you have to actually look at is what do you need from for your experiment. So if you need lipids, or if you need proteins, or if you need uh, uh, some other polymers and things like that. And and then what happens is that the different deterioration facilities at the different uh, at the different uh, neutron scattering facilities will be, let's say, specialized in some different types of uh, materials. Okay, so you can you can check uh, what would you be interested on, but for example, yeah, I think that uh, DMAX here at DSS, they can prepare quite a lot of um, small molecules and things like that, uh, but they also can do, I think, Maybe I'm wrong, but uh, detroit proteins, the one at the ILL, they have like a really broad knowledge on uh, the deterioration of proteins. ISIS have been good at preparing different small molecules and surfactants and things like that. In Germany, they prepare deuterated polymers. So I think that there is like a, the different facilities have uh, different expertise, but there is a common effort. So if you're going to do an experiment that requires something, Maybe you can talk to someone at, at, a, at even if it is a different facility to prepare that detroit material for you. So if you want more information uh, about this or any other thing, I'm going to write my uh, email in the in the chat so every so anyone can contact me. Any more questions? Yeah, I have a question. Yes. Uh, uh, the uh, the resolutions for these uh, X-ray produced and the neutron produced the images can be different. So when we combine these images to produce a single one, how we balance these to uh, you know produce a fair uh, combined yes. image? Okay, that's actually a very good question, and I will go more into detail tomorrow. And uh, as as you very uh, correctly said, that the resolutions might be different between the techniques. It becomes really challenging to actually. Uh, Take your data and say, okay, uh, if the, uh, let's say like they convolute the resolution. So what you normally do is you use some resolution models that are applied to your structural model. Mm -hmm. And for example, if you have an X-ray signal, an X-ray curve, you say, okay, this has a resolution of this value. Uh, when you are going to try to fit a model to that, and then you take this other model and you say to the neutrons, okay, there is this other resolution. So basically the structural model that you're gonna get is gonna be smeared by the resolution of each of the uh, pictures you take, let's say. And then tomorrow we'll talk about a bit more about, uh, about the resolution and how we implement it in the different models. But that's a very good question, thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Any other question? Okay, so I think that this is then all for the day.